Okay, in the interest of time, we will get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to those of you that are dialing in this very exciting webinar today from different time zones. Uh, my name is Martina Bianchini and I'm the IFRA president. I'm joined here on the panel today by our chairman, Hans Holger Gliewer, and Hello. the IFRA crew, Lisa Mecto, Marta Varela, and Charles de Lusignan, who are working in the background today, so therefore not visible. And I will turn it over to our colleagues from uh, Beyond Benign in just a moment, uh, because they will be moderating the webinar today. Uh, but before we do that, I would just like to recap our objectives, because today we have the third of three green chemistry compass webinars. And those of you who have followed this initiative by IFRA in the context of the IFRA IOP sustainability charter, you will remember <clears throat> that uh, we have in our charter element 2.3 under our objective to reduce our environmental footprint and climate change we said that we're inspired by green chemistry principles. But how do we translate that into a sectorial initiative? And that's why we partnered with Beyond Benign uh, at the end of last year, and we asked them to um, help us and collaborate uh, to achieve uh, three objectives. The first one, would be to help us raise awareness in the IFRA and IOFI membership about the 12 principles of green chemistry, and then look at how do these principles um, can be made relevant for the fragrance industry. Yeah, out of those 12, if we want to know what do we need to do better in our industry, Therefore, we said, let's uh, partner with John and his team to uh, go over this. And, uh, and then we created a IFRA Green Chemistry Compass Advisory Team of volunteer companies of uh, our membership. And those people have been meeting on a monthly basis and will come back to that team later on. And the third objective for our project was to provide really direction for scientists and other industry professionals towards greener, safer chemical choices and design. So that was the objective, why we got together. And we've worked uh, over the last nine months together with a tight timeline and a deadline in mind. And the deadline is uh, that by the 9th, 8th and 9th of November, that we see the timeline on the next slide. By the 8th and 9th of November this year, we will be having a draft green chemistry compass ready to be uh, talked about or presented at the upcoming IFRA Global Fragrance Summit. That event is a hybrid event uh, taking place in Sao Paulo for real and people can also dial in. So it's both a real event and an hybrid online event. So in order to come to this draft compass, we had three workshops with John Warner. The first one was in March. And in March, John has given us an overview of the 12 principles and described their relevance for our industry. Then in the Compass team between March and June, we worked and we looked at what are our member companies already doing? Because we have also companies in our industry that have uh, done a lot of work on green chemistry and they have their own tools. So in the June workshop, we had um, three companies uh, presenting we had uh, Simrise presenting their tool, we had Firminich presenting their tool, and we had Mann presenting their tool. So we looked at what our member companies are doing 
on uh, green chemistry and uh, we're very grateful to them to share the work they do. And then we debriefed and we saw that actually 80% of what we do uh, is in common. Uh, so companies that have tools, they also do things in common. And, uh, and then we said at our third webinar, which is today, we would also like to hear back from John, John Warner, and seeing how he brings the Compass together because his team has worked on that with us and the Compass team. And we wanted uh, to hear from another sector and we're very grateful today to have uh, Dr. Philippa Payne here that will share with us uh, what they are doing in the pharma industry. So that's the framing of our work. And I'm really excited now to hand it over to our colleagues from uh, Beyond Benign, Amy and Amy, who are moderating this event. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Martina. Um, it's been wonderful to work with the IFRA team here on, on uh, developing out this Compass tool. Um, I welcome to this webinar. We're really excited. As you heard, it's featuring John Warner and Dr. Philippa Payne. So thank you so much. Um, and Amy and Amy, it's easy to remember because we share the same first name. So if we're, our, we're your moderators. You'll see us in the background. Um, helping to moderate any questions and um, discussion um, after following the two presentations. So just a, a little bit of logistics before we get started with the presentations, um, the workshop format today, um, feel free to update your Zoom name with your affiliation if you, if you feel um, and you'd like to share that information. Um, this webinar is being recorded, as you may have noted um, upon entering, and um, again, question and answers will follow the presentation. So please ask questions and ask them anytime. Uh, if you're listening to the presentations and you have uh, a question, please type them into the question and answer chat box anytime during the presentation. And then following the both of the presentations, if you would like to ask, if you have a question, you'd like to ask it in person or you know, using your own voice, you can be unmuted, um, but to do so, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll see your raised hand and we will be able to unmute you following the presentations. So um, again, as you heard from Martina, the questions and feedback and, and your uh, feedback will be used to help shape and inform that final compass draft. So, um, yeah, just a few logistics. And with that, I'm going to introduce our two speakers. We're very excited today. Um, I, I, I know if you've been on these workshops, you've, you're familiar with Dr. John Warner, um, but a brief, a brief present or brief introduction. John Warner is a, a, one of the founders of the field of green chemistry, having written, co-authored the defining book, Green Chemistry Theory and Practice. Um, defined by the 12 principles of green chemistry as well. He's been an educator and innovator and worked in policy and, and won numerous awards for advancing green chemistry throughout these, these different industry sectors. Um, most, I would say most notably, um, he's, he received the Hoffman Medal from the, which is the highest award from the German Chemical Society um, just recently, just a couple of weeks ago along with his co-author, Paul Anastas. Um, and again, John holds, I would say, close to 300 patents. Um, he's, he's, he's really an, an innovator creating new green chemistry um, and also is author of um, a good number of publications as well. So we're really excited to, to kick off today's webinar with John. And I'm also going to introduce Dr. Philippa Payne, um, and we are very excited and grateful to have um, Pippa, as she's called, um, <laughs> join our webinar today. She's a senior research scientist in process chemistry at Gilead Sciences in Edmonton, Canada. She completed her PhD at the University of British Columbia under the supervision of Dr. Laurel Sch Schaefer before undertaking postdoctoral studies with Dr. Maurice Burkhart and Dr. Michael Gagne at the University of North Carolina here in the United States. At Gilead Science Sciences, she has worked 
on late stage and commercial small molecule and peptide programs, advancing the application of green chemistry principles in process development in manufacturing. And she is an elected co-chair of the ACS Green Chemistry Institute Pharmaceutical Roundtable, which she'll be talking more about their work um, today. So we're really excited to hear. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over first to John um, for his portion of the presentation. Okay, if I do this correctly, that'll be great. Um, am I properly sharing in presentation mode? That looks great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Amy, and and thank you, Ifra, for. Uh, allowing me to, to give a talk. I see I left an F out of if on my title here, but um, it's a pleasure to, to, to see you. It's bright and early here in California. So I'm keeping my voice a little low so I don't get bangs on the wall from other people in my hotel room. Um, but I wanted to, to, with this is the last of three workshops, I wanted to quickly run through and remind you of the, the first couple workshops. So our first workshop that we had, you know, I presented to you the 12 principles of green chemistry and left you literature references that are directly related to IFRA technology, the flavors and fragrances. And you can see that all 12 of the principles have neither just in the, in the last five, six years, references that have been published that have self-acknowledged. So when they publish the paper or the patent, they use green chemistry as a keyword. You'll see that there's each one of the principles they kind of collated. And then I got tired and so I left a whole bunch of them that you can feel free to, <laughs> to, to collate as you see fit. But I did come up with representative two or three from each of the 12 principles. So when people say, gee, you know, you know, not all the 12 principles apply, I would argue, well, actually they, they do, but they do to a different extent. Then I, uh, I thought that this would be useful to, again, look at the 12 principles. And from my perspective, each of the 12, there are two ways of looking at green chemistry. One as a research tool, and one as a way to report to your customers and to whoever you need to about the performance. Now, again, I would argue that each principle has both a research aspect and a reporting aspect, but it's kind of easy, easy to break them into into six and six. That prevention obviously is, is a reportable thing in which the, the attributes of your product can be reported from a prevention. Atom economy, I would argue, is more of a research tool. Um, the way you make the molecule is more of a research tool, but then the final product, the toxicity of the final product is a reportable whether you use solvents or auxiliaries is a research thing and maybe not all that interesting from a reporting perspective, but energy, obviously from a climate, you know, principle number six is very deep opportunity to tie into all of the different climate and carbon initiatives. Uh, renewable feedstocks, people are looking for, for non-petroleum feedstocks as a reportable. Derivatization is more of an R&D tool, something that people internally can use. The same thing with catalysis. Now, biodegradation is an important, obviously the European Union has a lot of new and upcoming rules in, in degradation. Analysis is, is more of an R&D tool, but OSHA reportable and other various reportable accidents and things like that. So it's interesting that it, you can kind of balance six and six, the ones that are more speaking to the researcher and one that is the ones that are more speaking to the external community. So this is a useful way of looking at the 12 principles this, this way. I, when we wrote the 12 principles, this was not the intent. It's just convenient that it did break down in this way, six and six. All right. And then we did in the first week, I took the five, you know, tiers here of responsible sourcing, environmental footprint, climate change, well-being, product safety trend. And we discussed how each of the 12 principles have different, you know, direct relationships between these. On the second workshop, 
you know, I, I presented this concept that the field of chemistry is expanding. People who think chemistry is a mature science aren't living in the same world that I am. We are on the frontiers of, of an explosion of new science, new technology. The thing that's important intellectually to, to understand is that there are a lot of initiatives to define what we want products to be. Not that, and so, for example, sustainable chemistry, uh, safe chemistry, circular chemistry, clean chemistry, regenerative chemistry. There are other ways. You know, people have come up with published books, published papers. Organizations have described lists, but these 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 programs define what we want the chemistry to do. It's like it's a statement of what we would want it to be, but it doesn't help a company achieve it. It just tells us what we want. I feel green chemistry is not another one of these. From my perspective, green chemistry and the intent of green chemistry is to change the field of chemistry so that more things that we do go through these hoops, whatever hoop you describe, you decide to subscribe to, whichever ones are important to your organization. So green chemistry is not just another descriptor of what we would like our science to be. It is a R&D tool to help invent those technologies to meet whatever sustainability objectives you've chosen to follow. Okay, and so for this, obviously, we need new eyes, and new ideas, and that's the, the 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 mandate of Beyond Benign and Amy Cannon's you know organization is to look at the supply chain not of molecules but of people and how do we change the field of chemistry so that more things just happen because people have the correct training because describing what we want. If, if I describe to you, you know, um, I want you to run very fast. I want you to win a marathon. I want you to cross the finish line before anybody else. Well, that's all good. It tells you what it is, but it doesn't make you a faster runner. It doesn't teach you to run a marathon. So we do a lot of describing what we want our science to do, but we don't do enough on how do you get there? And that, in my opinion, is the distinction of green chemistry. It's not merely a description, but it is gets into the, the minds and the hands of the researcher in the lab as they choose their reagents, as they design their processes. It is a tool to ensure that more things we do achieve these goals. All right. And so it takes a whole... Um, it's a you know, group of people to do this. We need to look at how do we communicate with customers? How do we create the objectives, the regulations and the NGOs, what, what it is that they're looking at? We need science, the toxicology and environmental health science to make sure that we have good assays to prove that we're biodegradable, that we're carbon neutral or whatever. And then finally, we need green chemistry to invent those new technologies. So the spectrum of invention to and test with good science and meet the regulatory and NGO and consumer communities and then communicate that success. No one of these circles can live by itself. We need all four of them to succeed as organizations interacting in the space of sustainability. And so we need to build consumer confidence in our individual products. That is about brand. That is about how we talk to the community, how we, what conferences we go to, how we interact with different organizations. And then we want to uh, also be talking about the research and how we talk about, you know, things from a science perspective. And so this, you know, when we are in, if we talk about our scientists, if we talk about the people working for our company and say we are training our scientists to be able to do this, that gives people confidence in the company. If we talk about specific products, we say this product is more sustainable than it. That's important. But when you go to the left, we're talking 
brands and corporations. When we go to the right, we're talking individual products. Both have merit and we need to understand when we're talking about our brand versus when we are talking about our products because it makes a difference. Now in the third workshop, there's a few thoughts that I wanted to close with uh, and just to, to share with you. And, and again, I, I wanna make sure that we understand that this is not the end. My email, john at johnwarner.org. I'm happy to answer questions and if we're friends for life here and anything I can do to help. But obviously, you know, there are a lot of approaches, responsible care, safe and sustainable, resilience, thinking in systems, limits to growth, the UN SDG, circular economy, biomimicry, ecology of commerce, cradle to prison, all of these. The thing we need to realize is that we live in a polarized society where people want to compete. This is the better one. This is not a better one. Oh, this is a fad. This one's true science. And it makes me sad. Well, you know, the reason we have sustainability problems is exactly because we can't get together and find ways to share our interests and our skills. Every single one of these approaches has merit. Every single one of these individuals who have had the courage to put themselves out and talk about a way of looking at the world deserves our respect and we should find ways that they work together. None of this should be a competition. How can we look at all of these things and how they come together? And so I that's a, a whole one hour presentation just about this. So I'm not going to do just the highlight is we really need to make sure catch ourselves whenever we're trying we're saying to ourselves, oh, this is a good process. This is a bad process. We're probably wrong. And we need to open our mind and recognize that that all of this has merit and that there is a diversity of problems that we are facing and we humans are a diverse species. And so every one of these has merit somehow, okay? Green chemistry, <laughs> a recent picture of Paul and I, uh, but I just wanna again remind you, when Paul and I were thinking about green chemistry, defining green chemistry and the principles, we didn't see this as a political movement. We didn't see this as a social movement. The way you know I was looking at it myself personally is when I learned chemistry, I learned analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry and I took classes and I had a textbook that taught me different aspects of chemistry through the reductionist approach. But I would argue there is no such thing as an organic chemist. You know, someone who calls themselves an organic chemist, well, they probably still do physical chemistry, still do inorganic and analytical. You can't possibly function if you say all I do is organic. And so I looked at the field of chemistry and I said, but you know, at, in 1991, there, there was no training, no university in the world required a chemist when they were learning chemistry, anything about how to anticipate negative impacts on human health and the environment. No one learned anything about regulations. And so what we felt was that we needed not a political movement or a social movement, we needed a science. What do sciences have? They have journals, they have textbooks, they have classes, they have conferences, they have workshops, and that is the birth of green chemistry. And so green chemistry, the utilization of a set of principles that reduce or eliminate the use of generation of hazardous substances in the design, manufacture, application, and chemical products it's been translated into a bunch of different um, uh, languages. I I sometimes am sad when people say, "Gee, you know, the you know." You know, it's confusing. What is green chemistry when the actual book has a chapter titled "What is Green Chemist?" in a section called "Definitions." So, if people are struggling to understand, well, you know, I may not know a subject either, but if I want to inherently know the subject without reading the book, I 
do that. That's not the way the world actually works. And so the intent here was to be as clear as possible. You know, all those other things I've described, clean chemistry, circular chemistry, sustainable chemistry, there's no real succinct definition. It's no, with green chemistry seeks to be different from all those others by being quite precise. And at the 12 principles of green chemistry give a certain precision. Now they don't do everything. We're not, we're not addressing every struggle that the human race faces here. The point of, of, of green chemistry, and I think I've said this before, and this is very philosophical, but a lot of times people say to themselves, oh, I should be the best I can be. And while that's true to a certain extent, a more important perspective is to look at yourself in the mirror, ask yourself, what skills do I have? What gifts do I have that if I don't do it, nobody else can? What is it that I am uniquely capable of doing that if I don't, it won't happen? We chemists are chemists. And so when we look at the sustainability endeavors and the challenges facing society, we need to look at what is it that chemists can do in the field of chemistry can do to address this. And I see green chemistry as being that unique subset. Doesn't speak to everyone in the world. It speaks to the chemistry community on how to invent technologies and how to communicate those benefits to this up and down the supply chain. But remember, from my perspective, green chemistry must, the only way it achieves its objectives if, is only if it gets in the real world. So although green chemistry, of course, has to be more environmentally benign and safer and less toxic, that is not nearly sufficient. It has to have superior performance and it has to have superior cost. If people don't use the technology because it really doesn't work or is too expensive, we achieve nothing. And so only if you have a technology that works better, costs better, and oh, by the way, it's better for human health and the environment. Do you have green chemistry? So I love it when someone comes up and goes, you oh, know, John, we are an industry. We need to worry about performance. And I go, <laughs> they didn't read the book. Because that's the whole point of green chemistry is that we cannot depend on a regulatory structure to protect human health and the environment because every election that changes, one new president, you know, a prime minister, uh, one new political group, erases everything, another one forms it and it goes up, and it goes down. The only way we can truly have a sustainable future is if we scientists invent the technologies that simply work better, cost better, and oh, by the way, are better for human health and the environment. But here's the thing, and this is what I think our society doesn't understand, is imagine if tomorrow morning, everyone woke up, every customer said, I only want to buy safe, sustainable technologies. Imagine if every retailer said, I only want to sell safe and sustainable technologies. Imagine if every uh, manufacturer said, we only want to make it. We're in trouble. Because right now, in my estimation, there's a few truly sustainable technologies out there. Maybe if we do an alternative assessment, there is some low hanging fruit, but right now the vast majority of technologies have not been invented yet. And this is the most important thing our society needs to understand. This isn't some epic battle of good and evil that industry is hoarding better technologies. Again, my definition, better performance, better cost, oh, by the way, better for human health and the environment. The biggest barrier to green chemistry is the invention. Now people say, oh, there are so many barriers, but I would argue there is no additional barrier to sustainability than any other new product. The status quo, the existing products have a very strong force to push back innovation. And if you have any new technology, the prices can drop, the supply chains are questionable. Sustainability doesn't actually in, in, introduce anything truly new. When we make a mistake, when we say, oh, new technologies that are sustainable have a disadvantage. All technologies that are new have a disadvantage. That's the way of the world. And we just need to recognize better performance, better cost. We can do this. And so I want to share with you, this is a little bit um, crazy of me, but I wanted to share with you 
how to think about inventing new products, okay? Again, this is a very abbreviated version of what could be a much longer conversation. I'm gonna start, you need to indulge me with my little story here. Here's my little story. There is a land of products. All the products on the market, if we go to any store, we see all these products. And in another land, far, far away, there are molecules. And these two lands are very far apart and they can't see each other, there's clouds in between. And the land of products who over the last hundred years have said, we need new molecules. We need new molecules for new products. And they try to see the land of molecules, but it's too far away. They can't see it. And if they actually could get to that land, it speaks an entirely different language. And then the land of molecules has been saying, hey, is, is this a product? Is this a product? Product, would this work? But unfortunately, the land of products is too far away. And again, if they got to that land, they would find that they don't speak the same language. But here's the sad thing. If what people don't realize is if you blow away the clouds in between, it's actually not a big gap. There are three islands of innovation. And when we invent new technology, when we communicate to, to our customers, we need to recognize these three islands of innovation. Okay, so the land of products, and you can imagine all kinds of products, you know, every single product you sell, whatever they are, they aren't molecules, they're products. But you know what? The island right next to them is the island of materials properties. These are the things that make a product unique and special, a quantifiable consequence of a molecular or materials mechanism that has a direct relationship in the performance of a character's work. This is where focus groups and things like that, things like color, transparency, flexibility, hardness, elasticity, these are materials properties, but they're still not molecules. The next island is the island of materials mechanisms. This is an intermolecular process between more than one molecule or an intramolecular process within a polymer that occurs over one nanometer through molecular distance. This is like crystallinity, chain mobility, Young's modular surface, and this is still not a molecule. The next island is the island of molecular mechanism. This is an intramolecular process within a single molecule or within a polymer that occurs under one nanometer of two molecule distance. This is things like polymer branching, intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, stabilization of a cation. This now starts looking like molecules. And this is how we need to look at the inventive process. We talk to a customer, we figure out what materials properties they want and we go to the molecules and we figure out how to solve those problems. The bridge between each of these islands is computation and chemical intuition. The mechanism to get pat over the islands, we do automation and experimentation. So AI, computation, experimentation, automation, this is where the future is going to make us so much more efficient. But here's the thing. People talk about fundamental chemistry and applied chemistry. And this makes me sad. You know, people say, oh, I'm a fundamental chemist. I work on basic research. And someone says, oh, this is applied chemistry. This chemistry is neither fundamental or applied. The person who is working on the chemistry uses a mindset that is fundamental or applied, but the molecule doesn't know what it's doing. And I think we really need to, to embrace that when we're inventing technology. So some people talk about a technology push. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna take a, a chemistry and push it towards products. And some people say, no, we have a market pull. We're gonna take a product attributes and figure out what molecules. <clears throat> and we have a constant argument in organizations about technology push, market pull, and everyone has their own opinion. They shake their fists and they yell and whatnot. And what again makes me very sad is that while both of these have aspects of value, they're both wrong. 
they will not lead to a sustainable product. Both will not. As chemists, we know that dynamic equilibrium is the way to go. We should be constantly looking at each of these islands and asking ourselves, how can we adjust this thing? And it's a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. If we go in one direction or another, all we'll end up with is products that don't work, that cost too much, and are fundamentally unsuccessful. All right. And so this is something I believe so strongly. You got to understand that in 2007, I was full professor in two departments. I was full professor of chemistry and full professor of plastics engineering. In the United States, a tenured full professor can commit felonies and not have a salary reduction. Why in the world would I quit that and start a for-profit company? Because I wanted, I felt that I had limited credibility as a professor. I could say, oh, People should do this. People should do this. But, you know, I am a full tenured professor. I'm safe. I can do that. So by giving all that up, but putting my mortgage, my children's education at risk, this is saying, okay, I really believe this and started the Wanna Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry. And over the next 12 years, we filed over 300 patents in all kinds of different fields of imaging, infrastructure, medicinal chemistry, composites, cosmetics, uh, license. These are all the visible ones. If you Google my name, these companies have filed patents with my name on it. There's a whole bunch that are not visible in the public domain, but this shows that this is active. This really does work, you know, and, 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 we, you know, the Wanna Babcock Institute, we have spun out six separate companies in cosmetics and pharmaceuticals and electronics and construction materials. All of them are still viable after, you know, all this time. And so this is not just me waving my hand saying that this is a philosophy. This is something that, that truly does work. Next thing I want to talk about is the green chemistry compass with this right now. I, again, I, I have taken some, you know, very early morning in California liberties, creative liberties here. So all of this is something of a draft, okay? And so none of this has been approved. So I'm just sharing my thoughts to a green chemistry compass for, for, for IFRA. And this is an ongoing work. And we've talked about this, the, the five tiers and, and things and how each of the 12 principles. One of the examples taken from the, the pharmaceutical industry is, you know, an example of, of a solvent guide from the uh, industry. So we have recommended, recommended, or problematic, 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 a hazardous, hazardous. And you can see that the point, and when, when, when people, I'm going to, I'm going to say a very controversial statement as the guy who wrote the book on green chemistry, I'm going to make this controversial statement. There is no such thing as green chemistry. There's only greener chemistry. That green chemistry is a relational thing. Something is greener than something else. But the point is, is we never really achieve perfection. Okay, because we're going to learn more every day. Science grows, science evolves. So using the metaphor of a compass is so good because that direction will never change. What we think is safe or non-toxic or sustainable today, our definitions may change, science will evolve, we'll learn more. And so what's, more, what's important is not these quantifiable achievements, but the directionality. So the compass is a really useful metaphor for us as we look at how to to address these issues. And so the, the last thing I wanted to share, this is my last slide, and we can make these, these slides available, I assume. Each of these are links to organizations that I urge you to, to look into. The first one here is the Chemical Invention Factory. All right, this is in the Technical University of Berlin and the German Ministry of Economic uh, Affairs created this Chemical Invention Factory, which is the overlap of entrepreneurship, sustainability, and chemistry innovation invention. It's a really useful organization to go look at. Another really good useful organization is at the University of Bath. There is the Center for Sustainable and Circular Technologies. A lot of interesting things there. This here is, is really interesting. It's more for the farmer 
but I would I, I urge this industry to look at it. We just got a grant from the European Union from the Horizon Program called Impact in the Impactive Projects, and it's innovative mechanochemical processes to synthesize green active pharmaceutical ingredients. So this is I, I'm the chair of the Science Advisory Board for this. This is focused on pharmaceuticals, but man, this is an untapped potential for the for the flavors and fragrance industry. This is something, and then the last one I just want to call your attention to is next year, the biomass to bio-based chemicals and materials. Gordon Conference will have a green chemistry focus that will offer other ways of looking at things. So I hope this, this quick summary of the first two meetings and adding some final thoughts is useful to you. And thank you very much for taking the time to, to listen to me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for setting us up with that and a, a recap of the first of the other workshops as well and the big picture thoughts there too. Um, as a reminder, if you do have questions as you're listening, please type them into the question and answer box and we will field them shortly following um, Dr. Philippa Payne's presentation. So with that, I'm going to now hand it over to Pippa, Dr. Payne. Um, so thank you so much for sharing um, and for joining us here to share more about the ACS Green Chemistry Institute Pharma Roundtable work. That looks beautiful. We can see your presentation. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Pippa. Great. Thank you. Um, successfully shared the slides, and so that, that's the hardest part. Um, you know, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really thrilled to represent the roundtable today and, and share kind of an overview of our structure, how we work together, some of the impacts and things we've been able to accomplish, as well as, um, you know, two cases of challenges and how we work around those with you today. Um, you know, thank you, Dr. Warner, for the inspirational um, discussion and, and, and set up for the talk. I think a lot of those themes really translate over into what it sounds like IFRA is, is working towards and, and what we're working towards as well. So and we have a lot of acronyms in our in our title. We're the American Chemical Society, um, Green Chemistry Institute, a pharmaceutical roundtable. So the, the pharmaceutical industry is really expected to meet patients' needs, uh, deliver medicines uh, around the world at an affordable cost while minimizing our environmental footprint. You know, that, that relates to everything that Dr. Warner presented as well as what IFRA has identified as a goal for your industries as well. So we're looking to balance social, environmental, and economic needs globally and, and for future generations. And so the round tables activities really come together with the belief that you know, green chemistry and engineering is really imperative for accomplishing these goals. The round table was formed in 2005 um, by three member companies, uh, Merck, Lilly and Pfizer, along with the ACF Green Chemistry Institute. And, and really the overall mission is to catalyze the integration of green chemistry and engineering in the pharma industry. Um, so we come from common ground and a common understanding, and we work in this pre-competitive collaboration with the nonprofit organization of the Green Chemistry Institute to really identify innovation areas of need um, that will benefit all companies. Uh, so working together, we're, we're brainstorming forming new ideas. Um, sounds like your, your team is also, you know, sharing best practices among companies, learning from an, one another, finding areas where we're doing things that are the same and, and learning from companies who are really um, leaders in the field. Creating tools to support chemists, uh, both in the industry, but also those that are learning green chemistry as they proceed through their training. And really, again, you know, identifying and, and acknowledging that green chemistry and engineering is, is a driver for more sustainable business practices. So since 2005, we, we have really grown to a current um, global membership of 41 companies. Um, this growth hasn't been, you, you know, steady the whole way through. 
just shown the chart here of where we started in 2005. And you can see there's really been um, a significant uptick in growth in from 2016 onwards. And we can link this to, to a few things. I think, you know, as more companies join, uh, they share with other colleagues, we present at conferences and just raise awareness of this community and this opportunity to um, invest and, and learn in terms of bringing that back to your own companies. Um, but we've also uh, made some larger changes in our business model. One of those was in 2017, where we expanded the membership options. So this goes beyond, um, you know, the pharma companies that are for full membership. They're really identifying, discovering, bringing right through research and development, all the way through to commercialization, um, therapies under their own brand name. And so we expanded these, the membership options to include associate members. And this really acknowledges um, other companies like contract manufacturers, where you know, they're the ones performing the chemistry, their business practices have a huge impact in terms of, in terms of our own sustainability um, footprint, and really looking for a collective mindset with both our suppliers and our manufacturers. Um, we've also opened the membership to affiliate members. So these might be um, other industries like agrochemicals, um, animal health that have a significant overlap in the types of molecules that they're making. And we might also share supply chain where we have an opportunity to really work together to impact um, all of our overall sustainability. We've also expanded into other therapeutic areas. So the round table initially started mainly looking at small molecules, but we've expanded to therapeutics like biologics, monoclonal antibodies, uh, peptides, and oligonucleotides as well. So, you know, sustainability is a very, many variable um, metric. And so bringing in our supply chain, bringing in a more collective mindset diverse um, experiences and approaches to innovation have really expanded the opportunities that we have to make an impact in this field. So this is our current member company um, logo. I love this slide, just shows, you know, how many people are involved, how many chemists are coming together from member companies. It's a really inspirational um, group of people that are, are committed to, to working with this. Um, and the companies around the world as well. So as I mentioned, we really come from a, a common understanding and, and I believe that that relates to, um, you know, the flavors and fragrance field as well of, of integrating green chemistry. Um, I've just shown here a brief overview of sort of the drug development timeline. And initially the round table was really formed around process chemists. Um, you know, looking at large scale manufacturing, that's where we make large quantities of materials. And so that's where efficient waste efficiencies would have a big impact. However, we really acknowledge that the earlier that you look at implementing and, and build green chemistry into the overall timeline, that can have a really big impact um, late term. And so the focus of the round table has really shifted to include analytical chemists, to include medicinal chemists, so that we're really starting from um, the most green option as early on in, in development as possible. We also share similar challenges and a toolbox for solutions. Um, Dr. Warner mentioned, you know, talented scientists. There's, I've just shown a few here, but you know, we build how we manufacture our molecules from innovative chemistry. So investments into innovative chemistries, into green technologies, um, looking at our shared supply chains. You know, we all build from uh, similar solvents, perhaps key building blocks. You know, how are those being manufactured? And, and where is that overlap where we can all benefit? So from all of that, that, that uh, common discussion and, and looking at where, where we come together, we've, we've built uh, our work around these four strategic pillars. So developing tools for innovation, 
So really to identify, design, and provide tools that promote innovation in green chemistry to help chemists make greener choices. Influencing the research agenda, so trying to bridge that gap between academics and industry and share our perspective, share our practices and, and our values with academics. Educating leaders, you know, to share that where this really um, overlaps with Beyond Benign, um, the merits of applying green chemistry. Um, so we, we support symposia, educational workshops, and finally collaborating globally to really provide green chemistry and engineering expertise worldwide and to acknowledge and recognize outstanding and inspirational science in the pharma industry. So the roundtable collaborates um, through targeted sub-team structure um, with 41 companies and all of those member companies having you know, their own set of employees. There's, there's really a lot of people that can want to participate. And so we enable this through these sub-teams that focus on specific areas. Um, each team is made up of two co-leads that are volunteers from any member company and then any personnel that want to get involved. So I've just shown some of the active sub-teams that we have at the moment. Some of these are enabling technologies. So those that are focused on biocatalysis, a recent one that's really interesting is our artificial intelligence and machine learning team with the idea of uh, you know, modeling reactions. If you don't have to run, the greenest reaction is the one that you don't have to run in the lab. Um, therapeutic types, so as I mentioned, moving from small molecules into these specialized fields that have their own challenges um, and opportunities, so peptides, oligonucleotides, um, tools and metrics are really a key deliverable for the roundtable, um, guides to, to inform research as well as um, metrics to quantify, set targets, and, and look for areas of opportunity. We have specialty areas I alluded to, you know, moving further back into the development um, into medicinal chemistry, making that uh, green, greener reagent choice as early on as possible. Uh, chemistry and water, trying to avoid organic solvents, as well as research and education. And a large portion of that is our, our grants program. So that's sort of the, the structure of the round table. And so I'd like to share, you know, some of um, our deliverables and, and the impact that we've been able to, to have. And so firstly, these are some of our tools and metrics. Uh, these are available and publicly um, on, on our website. So, um, you know, I encourage you to look at, at these if, if this relates to your work as well. Um, the first category I wanted to highlight today are these tools to, to support chemical selection. So solvents, huge component of our manufacturing, largest components of waste for most therapeutic areas. And so we have this interactive tool that helps people select solvents, look at their physical properties, look at their um, health and safety and the environment impacts. We also have these reagent guides um, currently, there are 19 guides, um, but more are in development. Our sub-teams put these together, and all of our tools are available to member companies for a year before they're then made publicly available. And so this picks a different a reaction class. It shares the mechanism. It shares examples at large scale. It shares some challenges and some opportunities. Um, our, our member companies have put together these Venn diagrams where uh, reagents are placed in a visual, um, a visual um, display based on wide utility, scalability, and greenness. And then you can select each of these reagents and look into the details. And then finally, the biocatalysis guide uh, put together by our biocatalysis group that looks at the most commonly used uh, transformations, um, shares information about substrate scope, whether they use reactions need a cofactor, et cetera. And this is just a printable, a, a, a guide that can be printed and that we're hoping our chemists will keep on hand um, to expand their, their assessment when they're, when they're looking at ways to assemble their molecules. 
Another section is uh, green metrics and quantification of their processes. Um, so process mass intensity is the key uh, metric really um, used by the pharmaceutical industry. And so we have a calculator to help chemists put this together. It just looks at all of the material input that goes into your process divided by the total product out. And it's a good, uh, it correlates well to other metrics, um, but it's a very simple um, calculation that chemists can um, easily put together to track process development and look for areas and, and drive in in innovation. Another one is this green method, greenness, uh, analytical method, greenness calculator. That's a web app. And it um, also looks at the greenness of an analytical method to, to drive development, um, look at EHNS impact of the solvents and, and reduce solvent waste. And then finally, in collaboration with the IQ consortium, um, we developed this IGAL scorecard, also available on the website. And that really gives a snapshot of different elements of a process performance, innovation, waste, to be able to track um, how a process moves through development. So these tools are available online, and we have other tools that are, are in develop um, that are in development currently. And this can this can occur either from sub teams. Um, so maybe the roundtable has identified an area like an acid base guide that would be really valuable to member companies and can put together a team to, to generate that. Um, but it, some of these tools have also come from member companies. Um, it sounds like your first workshop or your second workshop where, where companies shared their tools. So some of our tools have come from internal development that are then uh, tested and further developed by the roundtable and then hosted by, by the roundtable website. So roundtable companies have identified uh, synthetic chemistry and manufacturing challenges. Um, and we've published, uh, initially, we, uh, an area of key, key chemistry research topics which, which really need improvement. And so our, we recently updated these in 2018. And these include transformations where greener alternatives are really lacking or their areas of waste that can really have a, a big impact. So for example, viable replacements for halogenated solvents, polar aprotic solvents, uh, looking at improved methods for fluorination. And the goal of this is uh, both to help us um, target research funding in an area that will have a large impact, but also to raise awareness for academics or, or graduate students who are looking at an area of research of, of what would have a big impact on pharmaceutical related production. So we use this to then build upon our, our research grant program. And the goal of this is really to bridge the gap between academics and industry. So we funded over 60 research programs around the world. Um, over 2.9 million has been invested in research grant funding. And these are often used as the seed um, money to then leverage larger grants from federal funding agencies. So each spring we put out a request for proposals. Uh, the round table itself votes on what these topics will be. We have two different types of grants. The first is, are the admission grants. These are shorter grants that are really focused on innovation. So this can come from any academic industry around the world. And the idea is high risk and high reward ideas. And so, um, and anything is really on the table. It, you know, we've shared the key research areas and those are often a guideline for those applications. Um, we all vote on these. We have roundtable um, member companies are all involved in the grant sub team. And so we have an opportunity to really leverage, um, you know, your smaller member dues into a really big impact, um, especially for smaller companies, which might not have the capability of funding specific grants on their own. We also have these targeted grants. Uh, these are longer and they really focus on targeted solutions to specific challenges. And we vote upon the challenges um, that we're then gonna put out the request for proposals. 
Um, the grants are then, um, we then meet regularly roundtable members with the grant awardees. And so we have that opportunity for constant communication. You know, what are you going to try next? Oh, that, that reagent or that solvent might have a challenge for industry. Oh, we have this concern in terms of safety. Have you looked at alternative solvents? Um, you know, and we have a real opportunity to um, share our real world challenges. As I mentioned, these can then, especially the ignition grants, those are the first results that are needed to then hopefully springboard into a larger uh, grant funding and continue to um, push forward that, that innovation. That collaboration also accelerates the, the link between, I shouldn't use fundamental research from um, uh, Dr. Warner's talk, but that, that link between academics and, and industries. And then also we can share, you know, we can share our knowledge, we can help with training, training students. We also share the industry perspective in terms of publications. Um, so the green chemistry articles of interest, these are published in OPRD, Organic Process Research and Development, and published twice a year. We have a sub team that writes these um, publications and actually edition 30 was just published uh, September 6th. We also highlight current challenges in specific therapeutic areas. Um, for example, the oligonucleotides and the peptides. You know, we have chromatography for purification, really high solvent requirements, pol use of polar aprotic solvents that have safety environmental concerns. So to again, encourage that collaboration. We also introduced new metrics and benchmarking, um, benchmarking in particular to really look at what the industry is doing at a whole, uh, as a whole and to provide that, that target for, for how your process might compare to, to other companies. And finally, we recognize excellence. Uh, we have the Peter J. Dunn Award that really um, identifies um, excellence in R&D and execution of fundamental um, pharmaceutical green chemistry and shows that compelling environmental safety and efficiency improvements. Uh, this was established in 2016. And, and here's a picture of, of some of the, the Merck team as they presented at the ACS Green Chemistry and Engineering Conference on, on their work. We've also recently launched this um, CMO Excellence Award. This really looks to um, recognize outstanding efforts by Asian contract manufacturing organizations in the field. And our first awardee uh, this year was, was to ACE and Chem. Okay, so um, I, I've shared some of what we've been able to do um, and, and mentioned, you know, we're a global collaboration with 41 companies. And, and this really brings in diverse expertise, uh, but also diverse time zones, many different priorities, um, you know, different methods of, of doing our work. And so how, how do we come together and, and execute on our strategic, our mission and strategic pillars? And one way we do this is, is this type of a structure here. So I shared the sub teams. This is really where we deliver on our roundtable activities. We have a management team, um, the Green Chemistry Institute manager, and then the two co-chairs were elected. Um, we have an election every year for a two-year term. We set strategic direction and really support uh, the sub-teams activities. And then we also have these points of contact that really provide that corporate engagement. So we have one person from each member company. They're the point of contact that enables us to flow information um, to one person, and then they take it on to their company and share it with their um, within their organization and their um, you know their sponsor sponsor of the roundtable engagement. And then finally, this is built on you know our volunteer member scientists participating in the roundtable. And the level of participation is different for different companies. Um, some companies have these, this type of participation built into their role at their company job that really facilitates their engagement. Some companies have um, you know, a smaller team of process chemists, analytical chemists. And so 
Uh, we work to make sure that we're minimizing barriers to engagement, uh, but, but we don't have a requirement um, of, you know, a company needs to join a specific number of sub teams to make sure that we're flexible and, and are open to whatever engagement a company is able to, to provide. We also have three mem full member meetings per year. Uh, we run these as hybrid meetings. So we do have a component in person so that we still have that brain brainstorming, that ne networking, that sharing of best practices, but also um, you know, open virtually to support time zones, people being unable to travel um, and to make sure that anyone in a member company can participate if they'd like. Um, we duplicate some of our key meetings, like the point of contact meeting, to make sure that we cover different time zones. And we have a really great um, website and document management system that makes sure that meeting minutes are available to anyone at a member company who'd like, who'd like to, to, to read up and, and know what's going on. And the final example I wanted to give is, is benchmarking. You know, we've we've performed benchmarking in these four therapeutic areas. We really believe that this is a, a valuable exercise that that highlights opportunities for innovation, gives that industry wide assessment, enables those quantitative targets and um, objective measures of progress, and to identify what common inefficient elements of a process exist for many companies where we can then invest in solutions. And so one of these we've, we've built around process mass intensity that I referred to earlier. It's, it's been used for over 15 years and it's a very simple metric. It really focuses on resource efficiency and provides that high level snapshot of raw material components without going into very detailed process information. And so our workflow for these, uh, because I'm, I'm sure you're, you're wondering, you know, these are process metrics. This is how a company builds their molecules um, and, and companies that are, that are in competition. So, so how do we support that to be able to build that industry-wide assessment, but not share, not have concerns about IP or detailed um, company information? And, and so this is just an overview of our workflow. Um, you know, we pick the metric. The PMI is great because, again, it, it's a high-level metric. It just gives you one number for the amount of materials that goes in for the product out. And so we define the metric first, where we're going to calculate from, what is going to be included. Often we have a standardized tool to then generate a summary table. That summary table is then shared with our ACS GCI personnel. So it's not shared directly from company to company. Um, the GCI personnel can then blind everything, put things together into a summary table. All product and com um, company information is removed. And that's how we're able to then bring that back to the team. Um, and you know, the group of multiple companies can then start to look for similarities, challenges, and, and really dive into the data. So in, in conclusion, you know, I hope I've, I've provided a, a kind of an overview of our structure, how, how we come together to catalyze the integration of green chemistry in the pharma industry. We can identify those, those shared challenges and opportunities and really leverage that sub-team structure to be able to have small group engagement and, and focus on specific areas. And um, that's enabled us to develop um, in collaboration with the member companies, you know, high quality tools, metrics, and guides really support uh, grant funding and invest in areas of common need and organize symposia and webinars together to invest in um, future talented scientists. So this is a pre-competitive collaboration within our nonprofit organization, and we really work to invest in areas that will benefit all member companies. So finally, here are some photos from our full member meeting. Um, you know, we had our first member meeting in the summer since uh, COVID previously had not enabled any travel. And so we're looking forward to getting together at Vertex in the UK in November. And, um, you know, an inspirational group of people that has really been a pleasure to work with.
So thank you so much for, for the invitation and I'll pass it back to Amy. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Pippa. It's really, really interesting to sort of, you know, to see the collaborations that have evolved through this, through um, this work with the Pharma Roundtable. So wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us that overview. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, please do um, type any in the in the um, chat box and the question and answer box. And also, again, raise your hand and our and we'll I'll ask uh, Marta and Leigh to keep an eye out for any raised hands and let us know if, if you see those. Um, to get us started, I've got some questions here to, to start with. Um, and I think you just touched upon this a bit, Pippa, but you know, for, for some of which on, on that benchmarking slide, I think you touched on it a, a bit, you know, how has, um, can you speak to how it has worked within the Pharmaceutical Roundtable to work with you know, competing companies in this non-competitive manner. And I think you touched upon this in a few different places, but I think this is a, a really strong interest within the flavors and fragrances industry as well, how to work in that non-competitive space to advance you know, greener chemistry. So any, any sort of tips and tricks you think or why it's worked so well for your industry sector? Yeah, I think, I think one of the, the, the things that we, we come back to is, is that shared that shared sure. toolbox, um, you know, the coming back to, you know, as I mentioned, the focus is really on uh, process chemistry and medicinal chemistry, um, you know, we're a group of uh, technical scientists and we're really looking at, you know, how are we building our molecules? Where are we sourcing our solvents? And all of those have um, a sustainability and a cost advantage for everyone. So if we can develop alternatives to aprotic solvents, for example, you know, it's in our interest, as, as Dr. Warner had shared, you know, there's some risk with new technologies. And so if we identify this and we can come together, then, you know, every company uh, purchasing this solvent using these greener alternatives and that, um, you know, helps with the market, that, that drives that development, that helps with capacity. And so there's definitely a, an advantage for all companies there. Um, training new scientists, um, you know, making sure that um, development is happening. You know, there's a clear area there on our shared toolbox, which, which we can see has a clear advantage. Um, within the sub teams and within our meetings, you know, we have a, a strict guidelines for, um, you know, not sharing confidential information, not asking questions um, that are would be, you know, we, we would never ask, you know, what reagent are you using for this. Um, right. So there are guidelines for for behavior. Um, in terms of what questions are asked and, and what information is shared. In terms of the detailed information that goes through the Green Chemistry Institute, Ismir, our, our leader on that front for blinding before it's sent to anywhere else. And again, it's not a requirement. If companies are not, comp, you know, are not um, comfortable with sharing that benchmarking information, then that's not a requirement in terms of joining the round table. That's great. Yeah, I've got, um, I'm going to hand it over now to Martina for the for the next uh, question here. Go ahead, Martina. Yes, uh, thank you, John and uh, Pippa for two great presentations. And as we're thinking of our own compass and the tool we're going to develop uh, for IFRA, the question is, uh, you have membership uh, based uh, companies, it's only companies, they get together, they pay a membership fee, and then they identify the areas where a tool needs to be developed. And the, you said that for one year, the companies can use the tool and then you make it open source. So my question is, how do you actually build that consensus amongst your members on what the shape of the tool will be because John was telling us in his presentation, there's so many different approaches and all of them have merit. Yeah, they all work into the direction of sustainability. So is there, I mean, at the end of the day, you develop a tool, then uh, you have to build consensus, then is the tool, does it go through some sort of an approval process by your board or how is it vetted? 
uh, how do you build the consensus? And then why do you uh, leave it for one year um, you know, within the membership before it goes open source? And then also, it, presumably, the uptake of a tool is voluntary, yeah, because it can never be mandatory for com competitiveness reasons. But could you just share with us a bit more how you do that consensus and why is the tool uh, confidential within membership for one year first? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so the 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 tools as i mentioned can come from sort of two sources one is development in-house by a member company um and an example of that is maybe the solvent guide or we have a tool that predicts the pmi of a certain route um you know a, a set of chemical transformations and so that one for example was developed in-house by bms um, they then brought it to the round table and for testing from our member companies, feedback from the member companies before publication of the tool. And so in that case, you know, that was very much guided by BMS's in-house approach to the tool because it was developed in-house. Um, but it is shared at, at our full member meetings. We also had a sub team that formed around that group. So if someone from a member company is passionate, has um, key suggestions for this type of tool, then that sub team participation is an open discussion. They can bring it to the team and discuss and develop the tool. Um, we're working on an acid base guide that sort of mirrors our solvent guide. And that was built from key volunteers in the sub team in the round table. Um, so in terms of direction, kind of how the tool, what the tool covers, what the tool prioritizes, such as the reagent guides, you know, that comes from the discussion and expertise of the, the people who are involved. Um, the tool is also shared with all roundtable membership for testing um, and feedback. So, you know, I think there's key ownership within the sub team and the sub team leads. Uh, but there's an opportunity for engagement and feedback from all member companies. And so that's how we try to build a consensus there. Uh, we also have a voting um, structure. So full member companies have one member vote. Um, so in terms of some of our budget spends, um, do we want to support this conference? Do we want to participate in this? Do we want to um, you know, put an investment into this website? That goes into a full member vote through a survey. And, and that's how that's approved, apart from the discretionary spending from the co-chairs. Um, in terms of the, we, we keep the tool within the round table for a year because, um, well, we want to ensure that we're doing full member testing. But also, this is just an advantage for, for member companies that are paying their membership dues. You know, they get uh, access to this tool. But, but we also want to make sure that it's available to the broader community. So this is sort of a strategic decision, both for um, testing for, for bugs and, and finalizing the tool, but also to provide an advantage for our member companies who are involved in developing it. Um, I hope that that was a multi-part question. I hope that I, I covered most of those. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good. Yeah, and um, I think following up on that, which I think you just touched upon that we have a question here that can you give an idea of the annual budget for the roundtable, you know, that's contributed by the member companies? Yeah, um, so membership fees are um, annual fees range. I'm just reading off our website. I saw the question. I didn't, I, I wasn't sure what I was able to share. So I'll I'll, I'll read from the website. So the, the fees are scaled both for the type of membership as well as um, the company sales. And so annual fees for full membership are 10,000 to 25,000. Associate members and affiliate member fees range from 5,000 um, to 20,000 depending on company sales. Great, great, okay. 
That's great. And, and it's great that you have a lot of information on the website as well. So <laughs> and following up on that question, um, and so I, I know many of these questions here are directed at Pippa, but John, if you have experience, you know, throughout working with all the numerous companies that you've worked with too, please chime in. Um, but how have, you know, this is something, this question relates to something that I think has come up a lot within the, the Green Chemistry Compass IFRA tool discussions, but how have you been able to work together with both large and small companies, you know, in sort of the diversity of, um, of sizes, uh, you know, how do you, you know, in these tools, you know, it seems like they've applied for both the large and maybe the SMEs, but how do you work across those you know, the differences with sizes of companies as well. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's actually something, you know, we're actively working to support, um, especially with making sure that, we, you know, we, we acknowledge the importance that our um, Chinese and India manufacturers have on the supply chain for the larger pharmaceutical companies. And, and we need to make sure that we're accountable for our entire supply chain, you know, not, not just the, the later steps that we manufacture in-house or with our contract manufacturing suppliers. And so that discussion and collaboration is, is really important. And that's an area of um, um, work in progress, I would say. You know, it, it's definitely a group of people who are passionate about green chemistry, um, but this isn't always a part of their role. I think for the larger companies, they, they build in these sustainable elements into their job description. So a process chemist has a sustainability role and that really enables them to participate and um, contribute in a meaningful way. Um, but for smaller companies, you know, those employees wear a lot of hats, they cover a lot of roles and the company might run a little bit leaner. And so this is a challenge. You know, we we try to um, remove barriers. We try to make sure that um, everyone is invited. Our member meetings share what activities are going on. Our points of contact meetings share the focus groups, share the priorities. We have those one-page updates, which share you know what's coming up. You can get involved in this. Um, but I will acknowledge that the larger companies and kind of the founding members are maybe more active participants in the in the day to day. And so I think that's something we're we're still working on in, in building in other companies. Um, Gilead joined in 2017 and I've been um, you know trying to slowly we've increased our participation, getting people on different sub teams, matching people's interests of uh, their own personal development, their company um, goals, and as well as the sub team priorities. Um, but yeah, the, the engagement does range um, for, for different companies. Um, and that's something we're always working to, to get yeah. more people involved. Yeah, yeah that's great, and John. One, one thing that I would, I would, I would you know, recommend in my experience there, you know, again, I have to be colorful here. Uh, there are three phases of an organization from, you know, an early organization, mid-range organization, mature, and it's related to their sales. And I, I look at it from a creating mode, building mode, or caretaking mode. And interestingly enough, the larger companies with the larger sales are in a caretaking mode and are a more existing metric driven. Whereas if you go early on, people want to change the metrics and innovate and create new technologies. And so you would, sadly, <laughs> the world would be so much better off if the companies with the budget were creating more. But unfortunately, sadly, it's the other way around. And so it's important in any kind of framework to, to recognize that the early stage companies that might be a member of IFRA are going to be wanting to change the world. They're going to want to innovate in the larger companies are going to want to look at established metrics and things like that. And it's important for them to work together, but there's also a need to keep them separate because you don't want the caretakers to squash the creativity and you won't want the creativity to divert the, the 
the caretakers. And so those two need to come together, but they also need to have some separate existence for it, if to, to be able to respond not only to what already exists, but what will exist tomorrow. And so it, I, I just urge Ifra to, to I love the, the, the pharmaceutical roundtable. I think it's a model. The pharmaceutical industry was by and large the first industry to embrace green chemistry. Buzz Q was a, a vice president at Pfizer back in the 90s and started the world's first green chemistry industrial program within Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. And, and so, the pharmaceutical industry and the roundtable are an excellent example uh, to to follow. Uh, my 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 one comment is to look at this, the the early stage versus mature and and tap into the creativity of the early stage. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I remember yeah understanding what Pfizer was doing at the time, and much of it was done through incentives. So I guess maybe from from both of you guys, what's your perspective on what what pushes that needle within companies? You know, is it is it um, you know what what is is it incentives? Is it more you know so, yeah. not on the regulatory side, but things other things I, that might push that if, needle. If Ifra could consider offering a green chemistry award to its memberships, catch people doing the right thing and celebrate them doing it. So there could be at an annual Ifra conference a green chemistry award for a large and a small company um, and and model that. Doesn't cost a whole lot of money, it doesn't take a lot of time. But it is a wonderful opportunity for the member company every year to post on their website, we received this. And so I'd strongly urge if we're to consider creating a green chemistry awards program. Yeah, it seems like that has worked well for you guys, Pippa, as well, particularly with getting some of the small company participation as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was great to expand that to our contract manufacturers and and build those partnerships. And we hope that it'll be a business incentive for them as well, you know, to share this is a priority for so many, um, you know, so many companies partner with us. We we have this program, we want run this award. Um, it allows them to publicize their science that, you know, we host them at the Green Chemistry Conference. Uh, the Peter J. Dunn Awards does an ACS webinar. Um, and, and those are submitted to the round table and we have an awards team. Any company can have a member representative on the awards team and then full members have a vote. So we have a, each company has a vote on in terms of the application for who will um, be given the award. And we try to not include companies, the members for their member companies. <laughs> sure. Yeah, the um, conflict of interest kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, I think the awards are a great. It's really inspiring and very positive. Um, we also share best practices. Some of our member company has shared they have their own internal global green chemistry award, um, you know, building it into your goals and objectives, um, having an executive sponsor within the company who's at a, quite a high level, who can support your engagement, um, can support travel in the meetings. Um, you know, seeing this as a priority and what you can bring back. We also uh, write a end of year review to share what the roundtable has been doing so that people can take that into their company um, and share, you know, this is what our membership fees have delivered. That's great. great. I'm going to see if we could take this this one last question here on the on more on the metrics around the ACS on the green chemistry tools. Um, we had a, have a question on the integration of, of GCI efforts on product lifecycle analysis. So I think, you know, that's a, a large, that's a very complex thing to uh, measure, but ha have you taken into account any of that, any, any of the metrics and tools? Yeah, we have a tool that should launch soon. It's completed its, um, you know, time and testing within the roundtable. This was developed um, by BMS and it builds um a few of the components of life cycle um, into these process mass intensity calculations so it's a full calculator it links to EcoInvent, um a, a database and so you can put in your solvents and it pulls out some of the life cycle metrics 
um, um, like um, MassNet, CO2, um, et cetera. Um, so it covers a few elements of that to support some of that life cycle thinking. Um, but full life cycle analysis, you know, we, we don't have the capability to yeah. support that at this time, but we are thinking about how we continue to build out the metrics to cover those other, other elements. That's great. It's, That's a great question. The, you know, life cycle assessment and analyses is, a, is an excellent comparative tool. It's also a great place for innovation and creativity because more often than not, when you do it, you find there isn't enough data for certain cells within the assessment and you must create a surrogate. The very process of creating that surrogate makes you think of what are the critical aspects from a green chemistry perspective to succeed. And so even if there's a, a a lot of gaps in the data and the available things going through the process is useful to identify where those gaps are. And if you just sit and say, gee, what are the gaps? It's hard to do. But if you go through a life cycle analysis and then you are forced to see and you know, stare at very wide open where these gaps are, and that creates a way that collectively IFRA can share practices to fill those gaps in a non-competitive way. But the first step is to just hypothetically pick any product and go through a very thorough analysis together and find out where those gaps are, you will come up with a whole lot of interesting unmet needs. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. I think this has just been so wonderful to have you both. Thank you so much for your time and all of your you know, insight and sharing of, of your expertise and your experience. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Martina for some closing comments. Yeah, thank you. No, it was highly inspirational. A lot of uh, great food for thought and very good best practices. And also John's point on um, the research tools, yeah, the 12 principle, which ones are research tool versus which ones are reporting tools. It's a very good way of looking at it. And John has showed us very briefly what the draft compass looks like. Yeah, we are following a life cycle approach, uh, but we have selected for the purposes of this compass, the, um, the five elements of the IFRA IOFI sustainability charter. So it follows the life cycle of the fragrance and flavor value chain, starting with responsible sourcing to reducing our environmental footprint, climate change, and then all the way going to uh, partnership, transparency and partnerships. So that is the life cycle that we have uh, selected for this particular tool. And then within each of our charter commitments, we then looked at what are the green chemistry principles that would apply that we can then either use in research, but also report. Uh, because there is not of new legislation or non-regulatory measures coming in the European Union. One is called safe and sustainable by design. It's another name, another term, another definition, but it's all, all more or less the same thing, which is how do you move your products, your processes into the direction of sustainability? And then there's also new uh, legislation, new non-regulatory, but perhaps in the future, regulatory measures coming up on eco-design and there's a lot. So we want to make sure that we develop a compass that also gets fit to look at uh, what do we think we need to do in the industry, because we've taken this principle now, gone through the process, applied them to us, understand what they mean for the fragrance industry. And then the next thing would be to look at what's out there that's already been invented. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. So PIPA, your solvent guide is quite uh, popular or people think it's a very good tool that's available. So we might want to incorporate that to some extent into our tool as well, because why reinvent the wheel? Why, uh, why do things that others have already put a great deal of thought leadership in it? 
So if it's applicable or what is applicable from that, we will also use. And, and then uh, we will go forward with that. So it's really very uh, great to have had your perspectives. And as ever, uh, John and uh, the team of Beyond and Benign, Amy and Amy, it's, it's great to have had your input on that. So now we have a very tight deadline. And I also thank the Green Chemistry Compass team who has been now tasked with the, uh, the, the, the work to comment on the draft Compass. And some of you are on the call in the charter team. We count on you to make, the, uh, make your comments so that we can demonstrate and show the work in progress um, at the upcoming Global Fragrance Summit. Thanks. Thank okay. No further comments then. I would like to thank you all.